You can use a while loop to validate that you have good data. There's several things that can go wrong when the user is entering data. One, they just might enter pure garbage, right? And maybe trying to crash your program, right? They may have, you know, 10,000 characters in their copy paste buffer and they just paste it into your input and see if they can crash it. That's an old school way of trying to crash a program because C programs and other programs like that had limited input space and you would override past the end of the array and perhaps be able to, you know, take control of the program. That's not such a big deal anymore, but, you know, if we type in a letter where it wants a number, it'll still crash our program, and we don't want that. Another form of input validation would be something like, you know, enter a test score, but they type in a negative one or a 200 or something like that, you know, or pick choices A, B, C, and D, but unfortunately, they don't pick any of those, right? Or they type in a whole word rather than the letter that you're looking for. So you can use a while loop, right? You can check, check their input, and if it's not correct, you can loop. So a term for this, or one of the terms for this is, you know, sometimes I call it bulletproofing your program, but another term I guess more common is defensive programming. You want to make your program so that it doesn't crash as easily because if the user can crash your program, then they're not going to be as happy with it, especially when they do it by accident. And you know, you're typing in your term paper and Word suddenly tells you Windows has encountered an error and your application is shut down and you typed in a bunch, you'd be really unhappy that that happened. So, we like to do data validation. Now, the techniques of doing data validation, unfortunately, add considerable links to our program. Instead of just x equals input age, right, it becomes like 10 lines of code, or even more. And that gets frustrating, but what you gotta do in that case is put that code in a function so that you can call it and then, you know, you can just use that function over and over and over. So it's one line of code to call it rather than, you know, 10 lines. And it's very common for a program to be, you know, like 50% error handling, honestly. And error handling is something that's annoying to handle, right? And you want to write your program to work. You want to get to the good stuff. But as you know, with playing your games or whatever, if the game crashes or whatever, so there's a lot of code in professional software dedicated purely to handling errors so that the program doesn't crash if it can't connect to the internet for a while or, you know, if the user hits their joystick too many times or whatever, right? Whatever could cause it to crash. So there are several approaches or several things we can check for. And I'm going to kind of step through them one by one on the way to getting towards what I would consider good error handling. Looks like we're on lecture R. Defensive programming, also known as data validation with the loop. So what's one of the biggie things that could go wrong? We wanted them to type in something, but they type in something else. We wanted them to type in a whole number, but they tacked on a fraction, something like that. It needed to be an integer, but they put a decimal in there and that crashed our program. Well, have we talked about is digit and is upper and is lower? Have we talked about those things yet? A little bit. Yeah, we started touching on it. Then we're going to do it a little bit more. Okay, so you have some functions that can inspect a string to see if it matches a qualification if it match, matches a condition. For example, s dot is upper checks to see if it's all uppercase. s dot is lower, right? s dot is digit checks to see if the string is all digits. Unfortunately, it doesn't count a minus sign as being a digit. And it doesn't count a period as being a digit. So that's a really annoying limitation of is digit because I'd like to be able to type in negative 10 and let it, you know, is digit would tell me, yeah, that's a good number. We could write a more complex function that would check. But just for now, we're going to go ahead and use is digit and we're going to pretend that we're going to not be entering numbers that are negative and not be entering numbers with a decimal point. 
There are some others. S dot is alpha. Checks to see if it's an alphabet. Make sure it's a letter. You know, ditto, blah, blah, you know, letter. S dot is alnum. Make sure that it's a letter or a number. Ditto, letter or number. So we have all these things that we could use to validate our input. I'm going to go back above my comment. I keep thinking of extra things. If s in x checks to see if s is in x, which can be a string or a list. I think I'm going to change it to s for s in l. Checks to see if x is in l. And we'll give examples of these. Maybe not all of them, right? But for example, if we say x equals input parentheses quote a, b, or c, we really want them to type in one of those things. So then we could have if x space i n space quote a, b, c in quote, right? Then we know it's good data. It's good. Do something with it. That is shorthand for doing this. And don't necessarily type this unless you're feeling it. If x equals a or x equals quote b or x equals quote whoopsie. If x equals quote c. Right. Those two mean the same thing. One's a lot shorter than the other. The other's a lot more Python-y, right? A, a lot more techy, but the way the book's not going to show. So it would be up to you. Pick which way you want to do it. Now, what if we wanted to make sure it was every letter of the alphabet? If x is equal to a or b or c or d or, you know, going out to z, that would take a heck of a big if statement to handle. In that case, you'd probably want to use is alpha to make sure it's a letter, right? But this in syntax is something for us to tuck away in our brain. We could use it later. I'd like to check to see if a name is in a list of names, that kind of thing. All right, so we're going to do some defensive programming. Validating input to make sure the program can use it. Won't crash or behave poorly, right? won't crash or have logic errors. I guess I'll end my quotes here so that we can actually get some good examples going. So for example, simplest explanation, simplest example. Validate that the user, or validate that the input is a positive, or just as a, is all digits, all numbers. So age equals input parentheses age. And here's the line that would cause it to crash. Age equals int parentheses age. So if they put a period in there, it's going to crash. If they put a letter in there, it's going to crash. We can handle the period, but let's just say that we don't want to allow fractional ages for whatever reason. They're entering a bank account number, and we don't want to allow them to type in that their bank account is 012345.6, right? We only want the whole number for whatever. And this is dumb. I don't know why I put that there. What's wrong with that? What ought to be there? That's really stupid of me. I was careless. What are we doing wrong? We're asking the user for something, but they don't know what to type in, right? Enter age as a whole number, or enter birth year. I don't know, right? Something like that. In which case, our age variable should be renamed year, just because that was kind of dumb. So when we run it, it's going to crash if they type in anything that doesn't really exist.
which are all right, inner birth year, blah blah blah. It blows up. Inner birth year. Um 1973.5. I was born in the middle of the year. Boom, it blows up. Inner birth year, negative 1735. Well, that would actually work, right? But let's pretend that our birth years have to be after, you know, year one. Okay, so what we need is we need something before this statement to make sure that their input is good. So if year dot is digit parentheses in parentheses, and if you feel like it, you could add this on equals true colon, but this is optional. A pro programmer would probably leave it off, but maybe it makes it clearer for us right now. Then we could print, then we could convert it, right? So I'm going to tab over this year is equal to int year. And then I'm going to have an else colon print that wasn't a whole number. Parentheses and parentheses. And presumably your do stuff would go before the else, your useful stuff. Now do something with the year. Right. We're not going to write this stuff, but now do something with the year. That's where we would presumably put it. Now this is kind of lame because they only get one shot at it. They get one crack at it and it tells them they got it wrong. Inner birth year. Okay. One, two, three worked right. Inner birth year. Okay. Boom. That wasn't a whole number. Okay. And then we, we don't get to run the rest of the program because of that. So that's kind of a lame way to do it. But it does. This is the simplest kind of validation, right? Asking and then checking the input and if it's valid going for it. Now, honestly, when I do it, I prefer to do it like this. I like to check to see the opposite. I want to see if it's false. If year dot is digit parentheses in parentheses equals false, then we're going to print an error. Print error, not a whole number, in parentheses in quote, else colon, print, okay, let's do something with it. But I'm going to comment that out because that kind of conflicts with this. And what do I mean by that? If year gets converted to an int here, then this line would crash. So I'm just going to comment those four lines of code out. But it's a, the only difference between what I'm doing here is I like to rule out the good data and print the error as soon as possible rather than only print the error at the end of the else because that way, you know, if you're looking at the code, you understand immediately what it's going to do if it spots bad data, rather than have to scroll down to the end of the program and find out. So that's what this code does. Validates that the data is all digits, but it only gives them one try at it. Give them more than one try at it, we'd want to write a loop. Something like we're going to set a variable equal to false. We're going to ask them for input. And if the input is all digits, then we're going to set valid equal to true. Otherwise, it's going to keep looping. So, this time, we will use a loop, which will not exit until the data is valid. Maybe we'll enter birth month now, right? 1 to 12. Or let's just ask them for a number.
Okay, so let's set a variable equal to false. Valid is equal to false. It's not a good number yet. And then while valid equals equals false, and we could have written it like this. It would take a little bit less writing. It would be considered the more professional way, while not valid. That would be the better syntax for it. But right now I'm trying to pick the easiest syntax rather than the better, if that makes sense. Because that's our condition. Or we could change this to while valid not equal to true, right? Because once it becomes equal to true, it's going to exit the loop. I kind of like that better. Because that shows that true is our sentinel value. It's the value that causes it to quit. It means the same thing though, right? While valid equals equals false is the same as while valid not equal to true. Because it's one or the other. So let's ask them the question. Print parentheses, please enter your fave number. Positive int only. In parentheses, end quote. Another in parentheses. And let's get it. Fave equals input parentheses, quote, arrow to tell them where to type, end quote, in parentheses. But we need to make sure that fave is all digits. And if it is, we're going to set the data, we're going to set valid equal to true because it can exit the loop. So if fave dot is digit, parentheses, in parentheses, colon, it's good data. Print. Good data! Exclamation point. Now, would you really put that in your message? No. So instead, I'm going to modify this a little bit. If fave dot is digit equals equals false, we have a problem. Or we could rewrite that as if not fave dot is digit. I'm going to put that as a comment again. If not fave dot is digit, and not a capital D. I keep slipping over into Java syntax. So all these functions, is alpha, is digit, is alnum, all that kind of stuff returns either a true or false. And that's why we're doing things like this. We're getting a Boolean value from this function, and we're checking it. All right. If that's true, we need to print an error message. Excuse me, if this case, right, if the if statement executes. Then we need to print an error message. Print parentheses quote positive whole numbers only. Please. End quote in parentheses. And that needs to be tabbed over because I had an if above it. And I, the reason it wasn't tabbed is because I forgot my colon. So edit the line above to put a colon after the false. Else it's good data. So else colon valid equals true. And we could do something with age, with our favorite number, right? We could convert it to an int or do something. So now we can do something with fade. Now, golly, that sure is a lot more typing than just fave equals input, please enter your fave number. But it's also a lot better. It doesn't let them type in invalid data. It doesn't crash. It keeps prompting them, which is the problem with the other code. So, it's a lot better. Enter your birth year, 1975. Please enter your fave number. Now I'm going to type in garbage. It complains. I'm going to type in a negative number. It complains. I'm going to type in a number with a decimal point. It complains. And finally, I'm going to type in a whole positive integer. So you see what I mean? We're doing data validation with a loop, and we're looping until valid becomes true. And valid becomes true when it is all digits. Now that valid is true could be anything. It could be based on whether it's within a range. Right? We don't want them to set a birth date that's less than the year 1900, because very few people have a birth date less than 1900. 
or greater than 2019, because very few people at this point have a birth date of greater than 2019. So that's called a range check. So let's write this loop one more time. But we're going to do a range check. We're going to ask for their birth month, and we're going to make sure it's between 1 and 12. So again, we better set valid equal to false and have while valid not equal to true. So valid equals false, while valid exclamation point equals true colon. Let's get our input. B month for birth month, maybe just month, easier to type. Month equals input, parentheses, quote, enter your birth month, parentheses, 1 to 12, in parentheses, quote, in parentheses. But I'm going to come back in, and before the quote, I'm going to add a little carrot to let them know where to type. As a matter of fact, I had an input statement without that. Just for consistency, I'm going to go and add that as well. So I just scrolled up and added a, an arrow in front of my end quote on the inner birth year. All righty, what kind of checks do we want to do? One is we need to make sure it's not a digit. I mean, not a non-digit. So if fave dot is digit parentheses equals equals false colon then it's not a number print not a number end parentheses excuse me end quote end parentheses now we need to see if it's between 1 and 12 so I'm going to do else colon and I need to convert it to an int before I can check to see if it's between 1 and 12. I don't know why I put fave is digit here. What should that really be? It should be month, right. If month dot is digit. Okay, if you were typing along with me, please take note that I made a mistake there and you need to correct it. Okay, if we get here, then it is a digit and so we can convert it. Month equals int parentheses month. It's good data. But now we need to make sure it's between 1 and 12. So if month greater than 0 or greater than or equal to 1, and month less than or equal to 12, it's a good month. Valid equals capital T true. And y'all are going to hate me if I make this change, but I've, I, I'm wrestling with making this a little bit more elegant without requiring a nested if, or if it has a nested if, at least not all these else's. All right, forgive me. We're going to nuke everything from this line down, and then we're going to retype some stuff. Delete everything from is digit down, and delete that equals equals false. So you saw what I did. I did a whole bunch of slaughter on our code. So if it is a digit, then we can convert it. Month equals int parentheses month. And now we can make sure that it's between 1 and 12. If month greater than or equal 1, and remember if you're doing a range check to see if something is within a range, you use and. So if the month is greater than or equal to 1 and month less than or equal to 12, colon, it's good data. So we're going to set valid equal equal true. Not equal equal. That's a kind of lose me some points on the exam. Valid equals true. All right, now I'm going to back tab two levels. And we're going to add an if statement. If not valid, which we could say 
rewrite it as if valid still is equal to false. If valid equals equals false, colon, we're going to print our error message. Print parentheses quote. Input must be a number, a whole number between 1 and 12. End quote in parentheses. And now I'm just going to add an end while comment here. I don't know if this logic looks better to you or not. It doesn't have any else's, so I'm kind of fond of it that way. We were starting to throw in a whole bunch of else's in it. So what are we doing? If it's if it's numbers, and if it's greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to 12, then it's valid data. And why do we set that equal to true? Because that's our signal value. As long as valid is not equal to true, it's going to keep looping. And so if we get here, if valid hasn't been set to true, then it's bad data. You need to yell at them about that. And then it'll come back up here and it'll ask them for the birth month again. Enter birth year. All right. Enter your fave number. Enter your birth month. Now I'm going to start getting things wrong. F. It must be a whole number between 1 and 12. Negative 1. Must be a whole number between 1 and 12. Oh, yeah? 0. Must be a whole number. 13. Whole number. Blah, I'm getting frustrated. 12.5. All right, finally I give up and type in an invalid birth, right? Birth month. And at that point, it would do something with it. So this is a fairly good validation loop because it does two things. So now we can do something with the month integer. The above is a good example of data validation that guarantees that the data is a whole number between 1 and 12. And again, right, every time we've done this before, we could do input in one line of code, right, month equals parentheses, float, parentheses, input, right. So our program is much longer. But now it has defensive programming in it. Now it's bulletproof. Now they cannot enter bad data. Now at that point, well, we might want to put something in that lets them quit. The book talks about letting them fail three or four times and then maybe assigning a default value. Right? If they fumble it too many times, we just assume that the birth month is, is one. Well, that seems silly to me. But maybe letting them type quit to kill the program would be a good idea, right? They just don't know what they're supposed to type there. They get frustrated getting errors. They want to quit it. That wouldn't be a bad idea, and this doesn't handle that. We could stick all of this in a function called get birth month. Or we could stick it in a function called, uh, you know, get within range. And we could specify the numbers of the range, right? And then whenever we wanted to call it, now it would be nice to put the above code in a function that you could call like this. Month equals get underscore int, or maybe the word input, input underscore int underscore range, tell them what we want, which is the message, what is your birth month, and then the lowest value and then the upper value, right? It'd be neat to write that function so that every time we wanted to get a number, and let's say we wanted to get a year, year equals input underscore int underscore range parentheses quote what is your birth year and we're going to say that we don't allow numbers less than 1900 or greater than 2019 right like that and it would do all the looping for us so now we're back to being able to do our input with one nice little call right one function call
That would be why we would want to make something like that a function. We could take the time to do that, but I really kind of want you just to have the idea of validating the data and not keep making it a longer and longer chunk of code. So the homework is going to be to go back to one of your earlier assignments and add some looping to handle that data. It's going to be the payroll program, right? Make sure that they can't put in a number negative 1 or greater than 100 for the hours, right? Because we're not allowing them to work negative hours a week or more than 100 hours a week. We might get sued if we let them do that. And to make sure that they don't enter a pay rate of, you know, negative, negative number, right? And then, and then calculate the overtime. So we're just going to have to take that old program and make those changes to it. Using a feature known as try except, we could handle some errors in a slightly different way. We would not have to call is digit, and it would support decimal points and negative numbers if that's what we wouldn't want. But I'm going to leave that out because the point of this lesson is the feature introducing the idea that we can do data validation with a loop, and that now we have an example of it. Does so anybody need to see this code or get in syntax errors? All right. All right, I'll come back there. So the while loop can be used to create input routines that reject invalid data. Read an item of input. While the input is invalid, display the error message. Read the input again. This is slightly different than what I demonstrated. What I do is I put the, uh, here's how I did it. Uh, let me just copy that. Oh, great. This is a bad idea. All right, I'll retype it. Input data, while data is not valid, print error, input data. That's how they structured it. I don't think that that is sophisticated enough for our purposes. Because validating our data in that last case, we have to make sure that it's a number that it's digits, and that it's between 1 and 12. And that's awfully hard to write in a single while. So that's why we did this. Well, that's why we did valid equals false, and then while valid equals equals false, or while valid not equal true, colon, input data. If data OK in one fashion, if data is also OK in another fashion, then set valid equals true. And then back tab, if valid, or if not valid, right? If valid is still equal, equal to false, then print error message. A lot more. So this kind of looks clean, cleaner. But the reason it looks cleaner is it's not handling two cases, right? All it's handling is either that it's one between 1 and 12 or that it's non-digit data. It doesn't handle both. So I'm going to add some comments. This is what the book shows, but does not handle both is digit check and range checking. So that is why we wrote it like this. So you could tuck the book way into your brain. If you're not doing range checking, then this way is just as good. And I really hate to confuse the issue, but we, we might tack that one on. The book way. 
let's say that we want them to type in A, B, or C. So choice equals input. Quote. Do you like me? Question mark Y slash N. And then a couple spaces in a carrot. In quote in parentheses. And now we're going to make sure that our input is within those values, but instead we're going to exclude that. So if choice not, wait, 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 if choice in parentheses y in end quote equals equals false, if it's not between those two values, then we're going to print an error. Print parentheses must be y or n, and then we have to get our input again choice equals input parentheses quote do you like me question mark y slash in space space angle end quote in parentheses okay. we only had one validation to do there so their way of doing it worked just as well This one uses the so-called priming read, which is where you get your input before the loop, and then you also get your input again inside the loop. And that didn't work. Oh, I guess it, no? I wanted to see an error message if I typed in something that wasn't valid. Maybe I'll rewrite this. If not choice in YN, maybe that's what I really should have done. Let me see if that fixes it. Right, that did fix it. Now we're good to go. Okay. This isn't perfect because it would let them type in YN, right? So, we're going to do a little bit more. We're going to make this a list. So, we're going to put an angle in front of that. Quote, Y, end quote, comma. And then a quote, in, end quote, end angle. So, we changed it. We changed the syntax just a little bit. That line became considerably different as a matter, as a consequence of our edits. Now, this makes them type in lowercase, uppercase letters. We could convert their input to uppercase because it's not going to allow lowercase letters. If I run it and I type in yes, it's going to yell. It's kind of dumb. So, if and I wanted to, I could add a line that said choice equals choice dot upper. And then I would have to do that again, choice equals choice dot upper. It's not a bad idea to force their, their input like that into uppercase letters so that you don't have to check so many, right? Because we could add on extra letters there, right? We could say, you know, lowercase comma, lowercase comma, yes, end quote comma, yes, and right, it's getting ridiculous. So I'm gonna remove those things. There are ways of handling that. For answering yes, no questions, you might convert it all to uppercase and then just take the first letter, right? That, that simplifies the data so that it's easier to validate. All right, anybody need to see any of this stuff? I typed in a whole bunch of notes and you may not have had time. I'll slow down. Or did I not already? Defensive programming, validating input to make sure the program can use it. I like that. Won't crash or have logic errors. So, enter a number less than 10. They type it in. And by the way, this is a C++ language, and that's why it looks so strange with these double arrows. While number is greater than 10, and by the way, I'd like for y'all to take the C++ language over 
this summer. I'd love to see y'all. Y'all are good students. And I know you're bored during your long summers. You, know, you could be hanging out in Acapulco, but wouldn't you rather be here? All right. So if the number is not correct because it's it's greater than or equal to 10, print out an error message and let them type it in again. Now, this is only one piece of validation, you know, so they were able to write it the easy way. Counters. A counter is a variable that's incremented or decremented. We're going to count all the numbers from 1 to 100. We're going to count all the numbers between 10 to 1 by a negative step, which can be used to control the execution of a loop. Right? Keep looping while that number is between 1 and 100. That makes it the loop control variable. And it has to be initialized before entering the loop. So new topic, counters. A variable that is incremented or decremented each time a loop repeats. A variable that is incremented or decremented each time a loop repeats. That variable is called the loop control variable. So. We want to print out the word Fred four times. So it's always a question. You're going to start the counter at one, or you're going to start the counter at zero. Just to make this look exactly like the range statement that's coming up, I'm going to set it equal to zero. Counter equals zero while counter less than four, colon, print parentheses, quote, Fred, end quote, comma, counter. So it's going to say Fred 0, Fred 1, Fred 2, and Fred 3. Now, really, the user probably doesn't like seeing 0, right? They don't think their Excel spreadsheet starts on row 0. They think that it starts on row 1. So I guess I better go ahead and make that a 1 and a 5, because that's kind of more the way that humans think about counting. This is item 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now that's going to be an infinite loop. What have I done wrong? Right. Nothing ever changes counter. Counter plus equals one. So let's add some comments. This is the loop control variable. All right, I'm going to say initialize. I think I spelled that wrong. Initialize loop control variable, which I'm going to abbreviate L. CB. And then here's our condition. And both of these parts are the body. This is the body. And this is also part of the body because it's also indented. Update the loop control variable. If you don't update the loop control variable, uh, that, that should be a comment. If you don't update the loop control variable, not a lock control variable, then the program will be in an infinite loop. Now there are some caveats there. Maybe there's a re, uh, maybe there's a return statement. Maybe there's a break statement in there. But let's just run with this. If you don't update the loop control variable, the program will be in an infinite loop. And nine times out of ten, when I try to illustrate a while loop in a class, I forget that. And the reason why is because the for loop does it for you. Let's do the same thing, but with a for loop. We don't need to initialize the counter variable there. Let's do it here. For counter in range, 1, 5, 1, start at 1, go up and stop when it hits 5, Incrementing by one each time, colon, print, Barney, end quote, comma, counter. That sure is a lot shorter, and it does the same exact thing. The loop control variable is initialized right there in the for loop. Our comparison, our condition is right there. Our update at comma one 
is right there. So it does all three of these things. It initializes, it has the condition, it has the update. And so the only thing that needs to be inside the loop is, is that part of the body. That makes four statements ideal for counters. If you have a counter, if it's just going one, two, three, four, five, or if it's going through a list of data, then you may as well use a for loop. I strongly recommend using a for loop. I'm going to put a comment here that this goes from 1 to 4 by 1s, right? That's the step size, the step size of 1. That should not say 1, 2. That should just say by 1s. A for loop is a concise way of writing a counter loop. where the LCV initialization, condition, and update are all expressed in one line. As shown above. Now, a for loop can process other kind of data other than numeric ranges. It can also process what's known as a list. So I'm going to define a list called colors. Colors equals, and the way you define a list is with square, square brackets. And my colors are red, parentheses, excuse me, quote, red, end quote, comma. You don't have to put the space there. Green, quote, green, end quote, comma quote, blue, in quote, common. We could keep tacking colors on, but, but that proves the point. And I know you've seen this syntax before. I'm pretty sure I've asked you to do this. Have we seen that syntax before? Somebody meet my eyes and all oh. righty. Thank you. So for, and now I just need to pick a variable name. It doesn't really matter what it is. For s in colors, colon, print parentheses s. How come it's tabbing over so far each time I hit enter? I don't really want to tab it one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, I see what's wrong. Does anybody spot my syntax error? It's not even in this block of code. It's above the uh, those three comments there. Right, I didn't put a closing parentheses there. So if you were typing exactly what I typed, make sure there's a closing parentheses on this line that says print Barney. And the only reason I noticed that is because the tabbing was wrong. Every time I hit enter, it tabbed it to something weird. All right, it printed out Fred 1 through 4, printed out Barney 1 through 4, and it printed out red, green, and blue, as expected. I'm going to show you a fancier way of printing out those colors, and I don't care whether you use this or not in your programming unless I specifically demand it. But what if we wanted all that input on one line? For s in colors, colon, print, parentheses s, but we're going to make this a little bit fancier. We're going to say we don't want you to go to the next line. We want you to stay on the line. So s comma, end equals, quote, space, end quote. In parentheses. Now what's happening is, and don't type in what I'm about to do, by default backslash n is there inside the end. We don't specify but the, the uh, language assumes it. It's called a default value. And so after it prints out s it would go to the next line. And it still would if I left it like this. If I ran it I would see those colors all, you know, each one per line. But if I say instead don't go to the next line, put a space there. But once you're done printing them, red, green, and blue, all in one line, we need to go to the next line. Just like hitting the enter key on the typewriter. Print, parentheses, quote. Go to the next line. And let's put a comment here that says print the entire list as one line.
All right, and so here we print out red, green, and blue, but there are times when you don't want to fill up this much space. You might want to do it like that. If you wanted something different between them, like if you like question marks between each value, here's the point where doing data entry over and over becomes really tedious. Right, red, green, blue. All right, now I'm going to show you the really, really, really obscure. Well, it's not that obscure, but it's certainly not going to be in the book, and it's kind of out of the context of the book. If you want to print this list with one line of text, and you want them separated by commas, for example. What if I put a comma here? This is getting really tedious. Six, six, seven, yes, right. It prints out red, green, and blue separated by commas. Woo! But... Look at that. We don't want that there. So here's the really fancy way that I don't care if you remember or not until you take scripting. Print, parentheses, quote, comma, end quote, dot, join, J-O-I-N, parentheses, colors, in parentheses, in parentheses. Now, I don't expect y'all to remember that, but if you feel like it, right? If you feel like it, that will print the entire list separated by commas. So what does join mean? It just says join this list all together, putting commas between everything. You want to join it with periods, right? You can put a period there. You want a space between every value, because if I run it, it's going to say red, green, blue, with no spaces, just commas. But in our language, after we type a comma, we like to see a space. So maybe I'll put a space there before I test it out. About time to end the lecture. All right. All right, so you see here, it printed out red, green, and blue. The last way you can print the list, which is the cheesy, cheap way, is just to do print parentheses colors, right? And then it'll print the whole list, and it'll put squares around it, you know, square braces, and it'll put quotes all over it. The user doesn't want to see the data like that. But we'll demonstrate it anyways, because for debugging purposes, it may be really useful for you. Print colors. And what is that going to result in? It's going to result in something that looks like this. In fact, it's going to look exactly like this. I could just copy that line, paste it there, and that's how it's going to look. Normally, you'd confuse it, not that I want to see that. That's why we're honing in on other ways of printing the list. These two ways use loops, so it's germane to the chapter. This is a really fancy way of doing it, a really cute one line, terse way of doing it that you might do as a professional. Let me use loop, right? Not part of the book. Just makes it maybe easier to use. All righty. That's about enough. Let's say what chapter we ended at. Not chapter. What slide? We ended on slide 28. All right, so the homework. Modify the pay rate program with the overtime calculator, right? That takes hours and pay rate and calculates overtime in total, right? Add defensive programming to it. data validation with a loop to ensure that one here's our our limits hours must be a whole number between 0 and 100 so that's going to require using is digit And pay rate must be greater than zero.
Now your boss is a jerk if he won't let you work 3.5 hours that you know that week. But that's the point. So the point of the assignment is you're going to have input statements that are going to loop. You're going to ask for the hours, and you're going to loop until you get a valid hours, and your conditions are that it's a whole number between 0 and 100, and you know how to use that. You know how to do that using is digit. And then pay rate must be greater than 0. If you feel like using is digit, you just have to accept that it's going to be a whole number. So don't use is digit if. OK, we're going to make it use is digit as well, sorry. So pay rate must be a whole number greater than zero. Again, using is digit. Using is digit to make sure it is a valid int. So this really may only take you five minutes if you got the idea of the, of the validation loops. Or if it takes a little longer, that's OK. The more you pound your, for, your forehead against the keyboard, the, the better you learn it. All right, did that make sense, guys? Now, if you didn't do the payroll program, it's a really good time to go and do it, right? Let's figure out which homework assignment that is and make a Dropbox for it. All righty, guys, and we're going to have one more day of vacation, supposedly, on this Thursday. I apologize. This should be the very last time I have to take off for the... Uh, for the semester. So let's put that as a note. You get a free day. And that means that I'm going to extend the due date of the homework by two days so that you can ask about it on Tuesday if you get stuck.